All right, brothers and sisters, thank you all for being on time. We will be starting in precisely five minutes. Uh, we have to start on time and end on time. We'll be live streaming on the internet. And so again, if we could get everybody to come as close as possible, if we could fill up these front two rows, then it's easier for others who, when they come in, they could just kind of slide in without interrupting anybody. So don't be shy, fill up the first one or two rows. The closer you are to the stage, the closer you are to the energy. All right? We'll be starting in six and four minutes.
Peace and blessings, dear brothers and sisters. Welcome to the Summer 22 Smarten Up Black Male Summit. My name is Brother Derek Muhammad. I am one of the founders of the Black Male Summit. Let me first just say it's an honor, a privilege, and a pleasure to have you here and prepare your minds and hearts for a powerful, impactful afternoon. We won't be long, but we definitely plan to be strong. At this time, we would like to stand for a quick prayer before we get started with our program. Please bow your heads. In the name of God, the beneficent, the merciful, we beseech your help and we ask for your divine protection and mercy. We believe in you and trust in you for all that we need and we are your helpers in your cause with your apostle. So please grant to us a successful Black Male Summit. I mean, I mean, please have a seat. How y'all doing this afternoon? Man, I can't hear you. How y'all doing this afternoon? Welcome to the Summer 22 Smart Enough Black Male Summit. We want to start off by giving yourselves a round of applause for getting here on time, in time, and showing up with the spirit to tackle some tough problems, but we're gonna have a good time doing it. Before we go any further, I want to give a special thanks to St. John's downtown. It's wonderful pastor, Pastor Rudy Rasmus, the first lady, Sister Juanita Rasmus, for allowing us the opportunity and sharing their wonderful, beautiful space with us so that we can have a comfortable, cool spot to have our Black Male Summit. Please give Pastor Rudy and Sister Juanita our thunderous round of applause for donating this space to us today. This church, St. John's, is not the regular church. This is the type of church that is not, that's not as concerned with what goes on inside the walls of the church, but they are most concerned with what goes on outside of the walls of the church. Twice a month, you'll see them in the parking lot, feeding not hundreds, but thousands of families. They, they house families. They service the homeless. So this is a church that is filled with servants, and we're honored to be here today to be of service. Now, the service that we want to be about today, the business that we want to be about today is the business of saving the black male. As you know, there are statistics that state one out of three black males will be incarcerated in their lifetime if incarceration trends do not change. So if I brought three of these little boys up on the stage right now and had them face you and and I told you that you need to pick one out of the three that's going to end up in prison, it would be very difficult for you to do that. Isn't that right? So we don't have to wait for incarceration trends to change. We have to unify and put our skills together, put our time together. And if we get together and stand in unity as the Honorable Elijah Muhammad taught us that 90% of our problems can be solved if we as a people would just come together, stop fighting one another, stop with the silly competition about who's light skin versus dark skin, the Kappas versus the Alphas, Crips versus the Bloods, the Baptists versus the Methodists. Man, there's one thing about us, we can always find a reason to be in division. But what we have to do now is we have to find every reason to be in unity. And the time is critical for that. Now, before we get started, because we're going to move real fast today, but we're going to move real efficiently today. I want to start with a little illustration that I do at every Black Male Summit just to give a sense of what the Black Male Summit is about. And if you get this lesson and you don't get any other lesson, your time watching this program will not be in vain. 
So I want you two young men to come up here. Uh, Red and Malik, come here, come here, come here. We're going to do a little illustration right quick. Turn around. These are some handsome boys, aren't they? Guess what? Their parents brought them all the way from Ohio to attend the Black Male Summit today. All the way from Ohio. All right, so I want y'all to stand on that end of the stage and I want you to face me, all right? Stand right there and I want you to face me. Now what I want you to do is I want you to run to me, touch my hand and run back and stand where you're standing right now. Don't fall, don't trip yourself. You ain't got a race, but touch my hand, go. Go back. Go. One more time. Go. Go back where you started. All right. Man, hardworking young brothers. Give them a round of applause. Now, I want you all to meet me right here in the middle. Meet me right here. Now, we're going to pretend that it's payday. You saw that the both of them did the same amount of work. Am I right? Man, did I leave my money? Okay. They both did the same amount of work. Hold that for me. Now, we're going to pretend, we're going to pretend, we're just pretending that Red, he looked like Malcolm X, didn't he? <laughs> we're going to pretend that Red is a black man in America. And we're gonna pretend that Malik is a white man in America. Now Malik is not white, but we're just gonna pretend for the sake of this illustration. So now what we're gonna do, all right, I'm the boss man and they both just did the same amount of work. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna give Malik who is white, Five dollars. But I'm going to give Red, who is black, three dollars. What point am I trying to make to the young black boys who are watching? You live in a country where you can do the same amount of work as a man who is Caucasian and get paid less. Don't let anybody tell you differently. A white male in America with a high school diploma makes just as much or more as a black male in America who has a college degree. This is because we live in a white male dominated country. Give these young men a round of applause, all right? Now we're gonna ask Malik to go and have a seat. Now remember, Malik is playing the role of the white man. He gone home spending his $5. My question to Red is, what are you gonna do? What are you gonna do about that? I don't know. He says he doesn't know, all right? Let me show you. Go stand right back over there where you started, all right? Now he gone home, all right? You don't have the privileges that he has. So what you got to do is you got to work twice as hard as he works in order to get twice as much as he got. So come running. Touch my hand. Go back. Come on. Go back. Come on. Keep going. There you go. Come on. There you go. One more time. Come on. Give him a round of applause. Give him a little encouragement. Come on. One more time. Red, let's go. Come on, give him a little encouragement. Give him a little, give him a little encouragement. Come on. Ah, there you go. Good job. Now, because you decided to put in that extra work, because you decided that you weren't going to quit, because you decided that you weren't going to simply accept the fact that he gets paid more than you, you get a greater reward than him. So my message to you is, 
it does not matter if somebody else has an advantage over you, no matter what that advantage is, if you work twice as hard, you will receive the rewards of your work. So here, take your $20 and go sit down. Let's get rid of a round of applause. All right, all right. Did we all get the message? All right. Now, before we go, I want to talk a little bit about this thing called fame. How many of you know who Nipsey Hussle is? All right, put your hands down. The other day, a young man by the name of Eric Holder got convicted for the murder of Nipsey Hussle. How many of you know about that? Raise your hand. All right. Now, when I saw that this man got convicted for murdering and killing this special brother who was a rap artist who was standing in front of his own business, he, the story goes like this. He, he pulled up on Nipsey Hussle. He came and talked to him. They said that Nipsey told him that there may have been some snitch paperwork out on the street about him and that he needs to go and take care of that. Where Eric Holder went, he went and got his chili cheese fries from the food joint, hopped in the car with the female who was with him, pulled around the corner, pulled out one, not one, but two guns, sneaked around the corner and shot the brother Nipsey Hussle 10 times. The young brother did not stand a chance. And so when I saw that Eric Holder had gotten convicted of first degree murder, the first thing that came to mind was, man, I bet he probably doesn't even care. You know why? Because at least now the world knows my name. What I want to say is the young brothers that you see out on the corners, whether they're selling drugs, whether they are robbing, stealing, whatever it is that you may see them doing, most of the time it is because they want to be known. See, fame is a drug. Street fame is a drug too. It's worse than heroin. It's a drug that's worse than cocaine. If it will make you kill your brother just to get a name for yourself, then that is the worst drug that you could ever get addicted to. And so what we have to do as parents, we have to make certain that our children become famous in their own households. Our children have to become celebrities in their own communities, in their own village. So if your son makes A's and B's on his report card. I need for you to yell just as loud at him as you would if he did not clean up his room. I need for you to give him the kind of attention that he needs at home and in his neighborhood. And if he gets it there, then he's less likely to go out looking for that attention in the street. Because let me tell you something. If they can't get our attention doing the right thing, then they will try to get our attention doing what? The wrong thing. So when you see that young brother walking down the street with his pants sagging off his behind, our motto here at the Black Male Summit is if we pull up his mind, then his pants will follow. If we pull up his mind, then his pants will follow. But the reason he wears his pants like that, it's not because he wants you to see his underwear. It's his way of getting the attention that he's not getting from his community. And he didn't get it when he did something right. So now he's trying to get it from you by any means necessary. So my message to the younger generation today, there's nothing wrong with wanting to be famous. There's nothing wrong with wanting to be somebody. There's nothing wrong with wanting to be celebrated. There's nothing wrong with that. But my question to you was, what are you going to be famous for? What are you going to be celebrated for? Do you want to go down like the killer of Nipsey Hussle and be famous for taking the life of another special black man? That ain't no way to be famous. You want to go down in history as the one that cured cancer. 
you want to go down, down in history as the one who, who, who learned or, or created a new delivery system for restaurants or something of that nature. You want to go down in history as a creator, as an innovator. You want to go down in history as a god, not as somebody who took somebody else's life just to get a name for yourself. So be very, very careful with what you do in order to become famous and make a name for yourself. All right? Give yourselves a round of applause. Thank you. Okay, so the last thing I'm gonna do is I wanna set the tone for the rest of our speakers. I think the problem with us, particularly us as black men, is we just make too many excuses. Everything that I said to the young brothers today cannot be accomplished if we as black men don't stand up. So right now, what I have is a piece of paper in my hand. What does this say? What does it say? What does it say? Excuses. I want you to keep that word in your head today. Because every time comes up, somebody comes up here and tells you what you should do, an excuse not to do it is going to pop up in your head. And this is what I need you to do with that excuse. I need you to tear it in half, ball it up, and throw it away because we cannot save our youth if we continue making excuses. Thank you so much. We're on to the next presenter. All right, so right now I want to bring up someone who's very, very special to me. And this message is geared specifically toward black men. There's something that, there are things that we don't like to talk about that we got to talk about today. And one of those things is our health. So we want to bring before you a brother by the name of Brother Derek Childress Sr., who's gonna give a testimony about the importance of us as black men and black boys taking care of ourselves. Will you please do me a favor and give him a round of applause as he comes up. Hello everyone. This is a tough subject for me because it's really dear to, near to my heart. Uh, by the way, that's my cousin Derek. They call him Big Derek. Well, yeah, they call him Big Derek and me Little Derek. Uh, we was pretty much raised up on the north side of Houston. Um, I attended, I uh, graduated from Waltrip High School, went there to Grambling State University. I played football there, came back home, got into youth sports. I coached sports for over 20 some years football, basketball, and track. Even today, I talk to a lot of students, high school athletes are trying to get to the next level because I have a son that plays for the University of Kentucky. I also have a son that just graduated from the University of Virginia. He's gonna speak to y'all later. And I also have a daughter that's currently running track. She's been in state the last uh, two years at Klein Forest High School. But I'm here to talk to you about health. I need everybody to repeat after me, health, is wealth. Can we get loud and say that again? So I'm going to tell you my story. Coming up, uh, raised off of Curry Road projects, we pretty much, my grandmother, mother were in survival mode. So we virtually had to eat whatever we had in front of us. So as a black culture, for the most of us, we eat a lot of pork, uh, southern soul food type stuff that we eat. It just what it is. That's what it is. It, it came from our ancestors. I mean, I can tell you, my grandmother straight came to Houston from a, a, a share crop in Louisiana, and that's pretty much what they ate. The scraps uh, from the white man and his family didn't want to eat. So it got embedded into our family. That's just what we eat. 
but it's not the healthiest thing we eat. So me as a 25, well, me coming up playing sports, I thought I was invincible. Come to find out, no, I'm not invincible. Right now you're looking at a guy, I have kidney failure. Kidney failure meaning my kidneys don't work, meaning that I don't use, use the restroom like get up in the morning, use the restroom at night before you go to bed. I don't use the restroom. You probably wouldn't know it by the way I look, but I do my best to follow the doctor's orders now, but I probably could have prevent, pre prevented this happening as soon as it did. I'm only 47 years old. That's not old by any means. What I'm telling you, a lot of stuff, when you're young, mama pretty much takes y'all to the doctor. This For the females too, they, it's pretty good. My kids, I, I was on it. But because I'm big, buff, I play sports, my mindset is that I can overcome anything. And I can, I can will myself to something. That's, that's true in a lot of things we do in life. You need that edge to be successful. You need that edge to even inspire someone else. So my body started giving me signs. Just like a car needs all change, transmission fluid change, we need, our body needs maintenance too. Whether it's water, food, uh, you might have to go take a, a blood pressure pill or whatever it is to maintain your stability to be strong and to operate every day. In a black community, the leading cause of death is blood pressure. And that's really people not being aware that they have blood pressure, high blood pressure. That's one of the most silent killers it is. You can walk around no day and don't have no symptoms or nothing, but your blood pressure is high. So me, I ignored some of the symptoms that were going on, having headaches, attitude swings, just wasn't feeling myself. Blood pressure was out of control. Over 200 on the high end, on the low end in the 170s. When I shouldn't have been walking, doing what I was doing for as long as I was doing. But I ignored it. I kept going to work, kept putting back doctor's appointments and continued doing other things for other people. One thing you cannot do is help, your, help someone else if you don't help yourself. You got to understand that right now, as young as you are, you should know about high blood pressure risk because nine times out of 10, it runs in your family somewhere along the line. Somebody has it. Diabetes, heart disease, high blood pressure, high cholesterol, and it's all preventive or you can help maintain positive with pills, or doctors, you know, pills from the subscriptions from the doctor, or just simply eating right. Eating right really is the key to life. Too much of anything is bad. In the black community, we deal with drugs, alcoholism, and that, you go to any neighborhood where we stay at, I promise you, you're going to have a liquor store right on the corner. Stay out open late. And you go to the, they, they made, they put the beers at the front of the store, ice cold when you hit the door, cigarettes. They've got the vape pens now, which is another chemical that you shouldn't in, put into your body. But you got to really, really understand how important it is. You're going to hear this a lot for the rest of your life. But one thing I would tell you, the earlier you, you learn how to maintain your health, or anything in life, the better your life is going to be. I would tell you this. If I had heed the warnings that was before me, I, right here, I probably wouldn't be in the position that I am. I had a mother, a grandmother, and a sister all lost their lives due to diabetes, heart disease, kidney failure, and so much. Uh, I can't even name some of the other stuff. But I'm just telling you, a lot of us can be preventive with yearly checkups, going to the doctor when you're supposed to, understanding that in your family, you do have a high risk of it. It's there. You, it's, it's embedded in your DNA because it, got, because it got transported from one generation to the next generation. That's just what it is. 
But my mom and grandmother, I lived to see this to where I hated going to the hospital. I virtually lived at the hospital my teenage years behind my mother and what she went through. She had juvenile diabetes, which brings on other complications of the body. Her and my sister both. So 80s, 70s, 80s, 90s or whatever. My mama died in 1995, 94. She really didn't have a chance because of the technology uh, wasn't really there. She used to go to the hospital once a week to get an insulin shot to survive. Now you can take that insulin home and get your shot regularly. You can test your blood sugar regularly. That way you know what amount to give yourself. My sister, she had a little bit of better chance, but at the same time, she didn't have the willpower to withstand. It wasn't, I'm, at her time, I'll say this. It wasn't a lot of food or other things that took the place of what we were doing. Me being black, we still cooking soul food. Fried chicken, fried pork chops, you know, eating things that it's okay to eat, but we can't consume so much of it every day. Hot dogs, pizza, different stuff that are really processed food here in America. A lot of other countries don't eat what we eat in America. Hamburgers, they, okay. Hamburgers and foods like that are very hurtful to the body. But I'm going to speed it up to tell you a quick story about my story, how I found out. I ignored the symptoms, but I, I was sick, thought I had COVID, took a COVID test. Everything came back negative, no issues. But then I, my wife kept telling me, that, there, you need to go back to the doctor. I went to the doctor for a checkup, but I was just kind of being stubborn as a black man. I didn't want to go. I'm saying I'm going to go to my next appointment. I didn't make it to the next appointment. Wednesday of October 20th, of 2021, my, my wife tried to wake me up to go to work. I didn't wake up. So she had to call the ambulance to revive me. Come to find out, I ended up having pneumonia. When I say a lot of complications come, when, when you have one illness, other things happen. I became anemic. Um, um, I had fluid in my lungs all over my body. Come to find out, so the, the ambulance people came back and revived me. They say my sugar was too low because I, I took a diabetic pill that the doctor just gave me, but I wasn't eating with it. So I went into, a, 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 I guess, a diabetic coma. But the blessing was my, my, my sister and my, my, my wife and my daughter were there to help me through until the ambulance got there. They get there, they revived me, put, gave me like a, a sugar injection or something. Then they kind of revived me. I woke up, got to the hospital, did a bunch of tests on it, find that, that my, um, uter uh, my uh, bladder was empty. And they did some tests, found that my kidneys were shut down. Creatine level was at 23, but our cre your average creatine should be below two. So you know I was 20 times higher than normal. So I had to get rushed into emergency surgery to get a catheter right here in my chest that I have right now. I go to dialysis three times a week. It all could have been prevented if I just went to the doctor on a regular basis and understood what I had coming to me, I understand what was before me because I saw it with my family. I'm telling you right now, parents, try to feed your kids the best foods possible. I understand that we always in a rush, but the topic of my subject right now is trying to eat better to live better. Health is what? Health is what? I'm gonna wrap it up right there because we still gotta proceed and get to the next guest. But I'm just telling you, it's very, very important that you know too much of anything is okay. It's okay to tell your mom, mama, I don't want pizza. Can I get a salad? Can I drink more water than soda? Do y'all understand me? Can y'all do that? And I'm pretty sure your parents will, okay, son, I see where you're going at. And you can help them be better themselves. Because as parents, we need y'all on this earth as long as possible to raise your children. You are a parent to you to the day you die on this earth. Do not stop preaching and teaching to your kids about doing the right thing, okay? But I'm going to wrap it up, and I want to thank my cousin Derek for allowing me to come speak to you about that. 
I really appreciate everything y'all do. I appreciate the parents bringing the kids. I also appreciate the, the kids listening. And I ask that you take my testimony and be able to learn from and go from there. Thank y'all very much. Next up is my son, Derek Childress Jr. Thank you. No, there we go, there we go. How y'all doing today? I need some more energy. I'm big, I'm big on energy. How y'all doing today? All right, all right, all right, all right. Can we please give my father a round of applause? That took a lot, that took a lot, that took a lot. So like he said, my name is Derek Childress Jr. I am his offspring, I am his oldest son. Um, so he's Big Derek, Derek Muhammad's Big Derek, he's my older cousin. They call him Big Derek, they call me Little Derek. So it's like a little family, family lineage thing. Um, but again, my name is Derek Childress Jr. I'm a recent graduate of the University of Virginia with the Bachelor of Arts in Sociology, and I'm a proud member of the <laughs> Alpha Phi Alpha Fraternity Incorporated. 06 to the good bros. They out there, they out there. I see y'all, I see y'all. Um, and so the biggest thing I want to talk about today is getting involved um, and getting involved and giving back to our community. By a show of hands, can y'all tell me to raise your hand if you don't like the state of the world that we're living in right now. And my next question is, what you gonna do about it? I'm gonna let y'all sit with that for about five, about five seconds. What are you gonna do about it? So sit in the barber shop today, my barber had four pictures posted behind his, behind his booth. It had the word grind, execution, conquer, and hustle. And I personally would say those are four words that I live by daily. Growing up, I grew up in Greenspoint. My father moved us to Greenspoint at a young age. I was like two years old. Not the reasonable neighborhood, but he always sent us to school um, for better education. So I grew up in Greenspoint, went to school in Cypress Fairbanks ISD, um, and I always questioned why was that? Like, why couldn't I go to school with my friends in my neighborhood? What was the difference? But he wanted me, he wanted more from me. He wanted to instill in me the ability to get more because he knew that was more in other communities that we deserve to learn, to learn knowledge about, you know? And so I think out of that lesson, it just showed me that what I wanted to give back to our community. I'm big on education, but I'm also big on fighting for the people. Every time I open my eyes, my biggest thing is how can I make myself a better me and how I can make us better people. And so the biggest thing, my way of doing that is giving back and standing up for each of you that are here today. I would say over the course of my 22 years of life, I've had lots of experiences that has allowed me to understand my purpose of being here on earth. And my purpose of being here on earth is to constantly fight for my people in any shape or form. And me personally, my way of doing so is getting into different rooms and spaces where a lot of people are not, don't, don't look like us at all. Majority of the time, I am in a, in a predominantly white institution where I graduated from and I'm normally the only black person in my classroom, the only black person in the conference call, the only black person on a Zoom call, trying to make changes so we can have a better life and become better people. And so when I ask you, do you like the state of the world that you're living in right now? And you raise your hand and you said, no. What are you going to do about it? And I understand we live in a community where sports and music is thrived as the top tier. That's how you making it. But I'm here to tell you that that's not, that's not my way of making it. And I'm not saying if that's your dream, you follow, you follow your dream. But I understand, I want you to understand and adhere to the bigger picture that we are here for. The bigger picture is to constantly live and work towards a better life and a better, a, a better way of living and a constant elevation for our people. I understand that some of us may come from backgrounds that we, we, we don't want to remember. I want you to change that sorrow and that hardship and those experiences and turn that into motivation to become a better person, become a better you get involved towards initiatives that allow our people to become better people and for you to be, be the best version of yourself as possible. And that can be in any shape or form. 
Me personally, I am a type of person that is huge on advocacy, huge on community building, huge on allowing the younger generations like my younger siblings, my younger cousins, and even older generations to become more knowledgeable of the resources that are adherable to us. I'm personally, I'm big on giving back. So if I see a certain scholarship or a certain monetary opportunity for somebody that I have received before, I'm big on giving that back and letting, putting, putting somebody else on game to make it easier for them. Like I said, I graduated from the University of Virginia where it's 22,000 students, it's only 900 black students on the campus. Just imagine. My four years of college, a lot of people was, would say from looking on outside in was amazing. It was most definitely amazing, but I had to endure so much to allow people to understand who I was and to feel me, to feel me as a black man in America and as a black man at a predominantly white institution. I walked the, I walked the, I walked the, Walk the sidewalks of an institution built by Thomas Jefferson. Raise your hand if you know who Thomas Jefferson is. Right, that was my next question. Raise your hand if you knew Thomas Jefferson was a slave owner. I lived where my ancestors built. Every day I woke up with that in the back of my mind. I don't want us to go backwards. Like I said, it's constant elevation I personally feel like it's a mindset. It's a switch. How bad do you want it? How bad do you want it for your people? And the biggest thing, if you're not working for anything, what are you working for? That's big. If you're not working for anything, what are you working for? And it starts at a very young age. To those 10 and under, you got to understand it's bigger than just you. It's bigger than your mama, your daddy, your sister, and your brother. It's about, all, it's about us. If we're not going to have each other's backs, if we're not going to give back for each other, then what are we doing? What are we living for? It's not okay for us to go cheese and clock the white man's clock, but we constantly in the streets killing each other and thinking that's okay. I'm sorry to tell you, my time punching the white man's clock expiring because I want my own. I want us to have our own. And ain't nobody said it was going to be easy. Nobody said it would be easy. My father always told me, quick money, not good money. I'm going to repeat that again. Quick money, not good money. It's about longevity, about generational wealth, breaking those barriers and breaking generational curses. Again, you have to understand, if you're not working for anything, then what are you working for? We need to constantly wake up with the mindset to understand that you are working for your people. It, you can't be selfish and then be like, I'm in this world myself. No, you're not. You got a whole black race that's looking at you trying to understand that we want better. If you're not working for nothing, you're not working for yourself. Remember, execution, conquer, grind, and hustle. That's what makes it. What's going to set you, what's going to, what you going to do to set yourself aside from being the better person, from the person sitting right next to you? Not trying to compare, but you got to, we live in a world where you got to work. You got to eat to be better. For those little young boys and young girls, black boys and young girls that are trying to be great, that's constantly looking up to us. Like I said, if you're not working for anything, then what are you working for? And like my father said, health is what? Thank y'all so much. Come on, let's give this father-son duo a round of applause. As they already stated, these are my cousins. And quick story, when I was younger, their mother, my aunt, who was my heart, uh, my mom had kind of disappeared. They couldn't find her. So when he was born, his mom named him after me because she didn't know where I was and spelled his name exactly like mine. And then he was named after his father. So these are the three Derricks of our family. I want to say to you, cousin, I'm very proud of you. First of all, I'm glad to see you here. 
And when he told me about what happened to him on that day when he woke up but didn't wake up, I said, I got to get you to the Black Male Summit so that you can give your testimony. This brother looks 15 times better, better than he looked at the time I visited him in the hospital when he was on dialysis after he had his diabetic coma. Please give him a round of applause for that. Because if he did not make the conscious decision to take care of himself, do you hear me, black man? If he didn't make the conscious decision to take care of himself, he would not be alive to have seen his son graduate from the University of Virginia this year and to introduce him at the Black Male Summit today. Please give him a round of applause. Thank y'all. Love y'all. Love y'all. Okay, we just warming up. We're just warming up. Next, I want to bring to the stage I don't even know what the name of his presentation is, but because this brother is so dynamic, I don't even have to know. Um, not only is he one of my favorite men who wears the title pastor, and I say he wears the title pastor because he's so much more than a pastor. He's very near and dear to my heart. He just happened to be from my hood, went to the same high school as I did. Some of you may know him. I'm talking about brother Pastor Jamel Johnson. He has a word for you today. Open your eyes, perk up your ears, and get your mind sharpened for Brother Pastor Jamel Johnson. Let's give it up, brothers and sisters. All right, how y'all doing today? Let me say one more time. How y'all doing today? All right, all right. Um, I'm uh, very happy to be here, and thank you uh, to my brother, uh, Derek Muhammad, let's give him a hand clap. And I see my unk sitting over there on the side. Um, I, I love this man, um, Dr. Muhammad, if you all can give him a hand as well. All right. Um, so Derek has been gracious enough with giving me time. Um, um, I, I, I want to make sure that I am within the rights of that time limit, um, and I want to speak to you all today. Um, now, the message that I'm giving today, it is for anybody in here that's eight months to 80 years old. Eight months to 80 years old. By show of hands, does anybody fall into that category? Okay, okay. Uh, eight months to 80 years old. Uh, if you see on the screen, I'm, I'm uh, talking about I am, and, and that is a powerful, powerful uh, statement. That's a powerful phrase. Those three letters, they are amazing. And I'm talking about the undeniable power of self, the undeniable power of self, the undeniable power of self. If you sit next to somebody and they nod and make sure they wake up, um, as, as, as Derek said, my name is Jamel Johnson. I pastor the Word Church. I also serve as the executive director of the Fulfillment Project. I'm the chaplain of the Houston area, uh, 100 Black uh, Men of Metropolitan Houston. But more than anything, I love being um, the CIO of Increase Me. And CIO, I gave that myself, that title, the Chief Inspirational Officer. And I want to make sure that you are inspired before you leave today. You're inspired before you leave today. I'm running now. I did a quick Google search for black teen boys, black teen boys. And I did that after I saw this picture. This picture actually was printed in a magazine in 1972. And they talked about how young black men didn't have superhero figures that they could look to. So then what the mass media did is they tried to force feed an image to us of what a superhero looks like. And if you've ever looked at any movie, any Marvel movie, if you ever looked at any superheroes, you would be hard pressed to find a black superhero. And so what this, this, this image did to me, it penetrated me in my spirit because this was in 1972. 
And now in 2022, I still believe that there are some young black boys, but there are some older black men that are still looking in mirrors and they're trying to find a superhero. And unfortunately, the picture that's coming back to them doesn't represent them. And so I did a quick Google search to look up a picture of African-American teen boys. That was my Google search, African-American teen boys. And this is the picture that I saw. This is the picture that's on Google. And I kept going, I kept searching, I kept searching, I kept searching. And it took me page after page after page after page to find the next picture. Now, I'm glad that y'all clapping, but that upset me. Because if we can go back to that first one, the first picture that was shown to me is the picture that they want us to see. And that's why I had to go page after page after page. And if you've ever done a Google search, that means that there are hundreds of photos I had to go through just to get to a, a, a picture that looked like something that I want our young men to look at. And so it's, it's, it's no, it's, it's, it's for me because I know the back end of what they do and how they do. I know that it's pointed. They want us to believe that the first picture is the only picture that we have in our communities. The first picture is the only picture that you can live up to because they don't want you to see this picture because if you ever see this picture, if you ever see this picture, you're going to see lawyers in that picture. You're going to see doctors in that picture. They want you to see the other picture because if you keep seeing that other picture, it's going to be easy for them to see you in a box. But today I want to inspire you to see who you really are. I want to help you today if you are in here, if you are eight months to 80 years old, because there are some of us that are still in our 40s, in our 50s. We're still bumping through life trying to find ourselves and I'm going to give you five quick self-assessments that's going to help you tap into the undeniable power of self. The undeniable power of self. Because if you ever know who you are, if you ever know whose you are, I said this on accident on a radio show this week and I felt like it was dope. I stopped in the middle of what I was saying and I gave myself some snaps. I said that if you don't ever really know who you are, you will spend your life getting up in the morning, pulling up a flag that represents somebody else and not even knowing that you got a flag yourself. Not even knowing who you are. So the first thing that you have to do to unlock this undeniable power of self is you have to have self-awareness. You have to have self-awareness. I pastor the Word Church. My mom is a retired educator, 40 years in North Forest, taught at W.E. Rogers for 40 long years. Before I could go outside, this was back in the olden days, the old 1900s. Before I could go outside, I know some of you all, y'all outside is familiar, but for us outside, it was crunk outside. And we were punished by not being able to go outside. Now we would have to bribe some of you all to go outside, but that's another story for a different day. But before I had to go out, before I could go outside in the summer, I, my mom would make me define 10 words and I would have to use them in sentences before I could go anywhere. And my mama told me that she did that. She said, because Jamel, I see greatness on you. I was nine years old asking her, mama, why are you doing this? I felt like that it was corporal punishment. Why are you doing this? Why can't you just go outside? She said, because I see greatness on you and I don't ever want you to ever get invited into a room and you're not able to have a handle on your own language. That's why I pastor the word church. So we're going to define some words. By definition, self-awareness is conscious knowledge of one's own character, one's own feelings, one's own motives, and one's own de desires. If you don't know who you are, you will live your life trying to be somebody else. And if I can just tell you this, the you that you are, you are dope. The you that you are, you are amazing. The you that you are, even on your worst day, you are the best version of you because there is no other version of you but you. So why in the world? Would you be born an original and die a copy? I want to give you this quote. Uh, this quote says from Inc.com. 
Inc.com. I'm also giving some of you all some game as you get into the business world. Studies increasingly show that self-awareness is more valuable than smarts alone. Research shows that leaders who are more self-aware get promoted faster and are awarded more re responsibility. What that means is, is that when I come into the room because I know who I am, the reason why I'm able to be promoted faster and have more doors open for me is because I don't get in the room and act like I'm not supposed to be there. I don't get in the room and start shrinking. I don't get in the room and start speaking underneath my tongue. I remember I was 15 years old, got a chance to represent Forest Brook Senior High School in Washington, D.C. Got a chance to go meet President Bill Clinton at the time, and I was nervous. My daddy, Arthur Joe Johnson, he looked at me and he said, Jamel, when you get up there, don't be acting nervous. I say, but daddy, he's the president. My daddy said, so? He's a man. And he put his pants on one leg at a time. And in that moment, my daddy instilled in me something that is still rocking with me today. You are blessed when I enter the room. All right, let me go to this next one. Because Derek been wrapping people up. I don't want to get in trouble. Uh, PsychCentral.com says most people don't give much thought to their own self-awareness. Most people don't give much thought to their own self-awareness. So if you start to look in the mirror and question who you are and live up to your own self-awareness, you are ahead of the curve. It's a yet being aware of yourself is an absolute requirement. Say that it's a requirement for being able to make yourself and your life happy, healthy, and strong. That's why so many people that are miserable now is because they're living their life looking for likes. They're living their life looking for shares. They're living their life looking for views. And if I post a post and don't nobody like it, I liked it, that's why I posted it. All right. The next one is self-empowerment, self-empowerment. Do me a favor, put your hand over your shoulder and pat yourself on the back. Self-empowerment. Self-empowerment is deriving the strength and authority to do something through one's own thoughts and based on the belief that one knows what is best for oneself. This is di direct reflection from self-awareness. You cannot empower yourself if you don't know who you are. Um, next slide. Oh, Lord, I'm a preacher. So I'm just going to read this scripture. I ain't going to preach it. I'm just going to read it. But it's from the Amplified Version. I want you to hear this. Then God said, let us make man in our own image according to our likeness. And the Amplified Version blows this scripture up and says, not physical, but a spiritual personality and moral likeness. And let them have complete authority. Somebody say complete authority. What Big G was saying is, I'm going to take care of heaven, y'all handle earth. Oh, okay. I, I, I guess with a slavery theology, you're still looking at him as your master when that's really your father. And if that's your father, you have access to everything daddy does. All right. That's a whole nother conversation. Y'all, let's keep on going. I'm trying to move fast. Oh, this is my point. If you believe you have the authority and power to take actions and make decisions for yourself, you will do so. But if deep down you question this, you will hesitate. And life's decisions will be made for you. Let me go to the next one because I really want to help you. Am I helping y'all so far? Self-improvement, self-improvement. What that means is, is every day I wake up with a desire to be the best me that I can be. Self-improvement, the improvement of one's knowledge, status, or character by one's own effort. Uh, my guy, Aubrey Graham, y'all know him, Drake, the light-skinned dude from Canada. It's a whole bunch of people that were upset that Drake came out with this dance CD. Everybody keeps saying, we want the old Drake, we want the old Drake. But what people don't understand is, is he has mastered the rap and R&B genre. So he says, let me go to another lane that I have never been in, that people don't expect me to be in. And he dropped a CD and he was number one overnight. What that suggests to me is, is two things. People always want you to remain who you were because who you will be is a threat to them. 
And then the second thing is, is you don't need nobody else's permission to be a better version of you. If you want to be a better version of you, if you, I'm going to take from this point on, man, I'm going to take the thought process of Kevin Durant. If y'all ain't trying to win no championship, let me go and find somewhere else to go. It's a lot of people looking down on that boy, but I would rather be Kevin Durant and know my value and attach it to other winners than to be like Charles Barkley and always be the butt of everybody's joke. All right, all right. Les Brown said perfection does not exist. You can always do better and you can always grow. You can always do better and you can always grow. I'm looking to land the plane right now. Jim Rohn said formal education will make you a living, but self-education will make you a fortune. Formal education will make you a living, but self-education will make you a fortune. And they used to have this statement back in the day, and if you wanted to hide something from a black man, put it in a book. Well, if you don't like reading, I, don't, I, I ain't tripping, but take your tail to YouTube and look at some video videos. YouTube has now become YouTube University. You can actually go to YouTube and watch a video to learn how to code, and you can come back and make your own video games and sell it to your home boys and you can get paid from your friends for them playing your game rather than wasting time start investing the time that you have but it all comes with every day waking up wanting to be the better version of you next one is self-motivation this is number four i only got five self-motivation self-motivation is motivated to do or achieve something because of one's own enthusiasm or interest without needing pressure from others I wake up every morning and my brother Derek, he posts this on social media. And he said that if I wake up in the morning, I'm looking down at the dirt and the dirt ain't on top of me. Boy, that's a good day. And that motivates me to give that day all that I got. I'm not going to sleep until I have earned every hour that I will be sleep. But I'm motivated. Something drives me. I have two boys, they drive me. I have a wife that every time a bill come in the house, I say, don't touch that mail, those are my bills. It drives me. I have a church that I pastor that I want them to be the best and know that their relationship with God is now affirming them to be everything that God has created them to be. I am driven, I am driven to ensure that not another young man ends up going to jail when they have an opportunity to go to Yale. I am motivated, I'm motivated to make sure that these cops get their foot off of our neck and help us in our communities and stop hurting us. I am motivated, but that's what drives me. But what is driving you? Come on, brother. And I ain't said nothing about money. Because as long as I continue to do what I have been created to do, money gonna find me. Because there's so many people that's out in these streets chasing bags and don't know that those bags have become baggage. All right. Uh, do I have another quote? Kobe Bryant. That was man. That was my. That was my guy. Greatest basketball player ever lived. I know. Y'all say LeBron. I know. You say Michael Jordan. I say Kobe Bryant. This is about self. Let me have Kobe Bryant to be my favorite basketball player. Kobe Bryant say, "I succeed on my own personal motivation." dedication and commitment my mindset is if i'm not out there training someone else is this is my last point and i'm done and this is one of the most important things and little derek you said it self replicating now this is a scientific definition but it says re reproducing itself by its own power or inherent nature what does that mean pastor jay as i go to this seat we have a responsibility. And now this may be to the ones that are a little bit older. We have a responsibility to grab our young boys and to bring them close to us and to show them the way. But I will say this, before we can ever do this, Adam, we got to do this. Relationship makes mentoring easy. Dr. Muhammad could catch me and tell me anything he want. He can holler at me like my dad if he wanted to. But the first thing that he did when he saw me is he put his arm around me. We have a responsibility for everybody that comes behind us. Even if you're 12 and you got a brother that's six, he's looking at you. Even if you're 18 and you got a cousin that's 11, they're looking at you. 
And we have a responsibility to replicate ourselves. We have a responsibility to be the best that we could be because Solomon said, as iron sharpens iron, so one man sharpens and influences another. I want to give you all this affirmation because you all didn't know I was just giving you everything that you needed. Next slide. Everything that you needed to ensure that you tap into the greatest portion of you. Dr. King said life's most persistent and urgent question is what are you doing for others? I am is a powerful statement and you didn't know that you were just unlocking the keys to you tapping into yourself. If, if, if you got a phone i want everybody to take your phone out right now i want you to take a picture of the screen i'm done y'all hope i blessed you hope i said something that may have caused you um, um to look at yourself and know that you are an amazing self but everything that i said that had self in front of it now when i remove self and i replace that with i am i am aware i am empowered I am improving, I am motivated, and I am replicating. I am aware, I am empowered, I am improving, I am motivated, I am replicating. I want, I want to make sure that everybody that's here has an opportunity to get this book. I ain't even charging y'all, just scan the QR code and it's going to be a digital download that's going to come to you. Every chapter in there challenges you to be something different. Be great, be great, be dope, be creative, be inspired, be resilient. This came from my mama's bulletin board at W. Rogers. I said, if it is to be, it is up to me. God bless you. Man, I know y'all can do better than that. After all of the energy that that brother just gave to us, we just need you to give it back. Phenomenal message. Phenomenal message. All right, we're going to keep it moving. As brother uh, Jamil Johnson spoke, he talked about the self-improvement. But at one point he said, I ain't even talking about money. But guess what? We about to start talking about money. <laughs> How many of you in here want to be your own boss? Raise your hand. All right. How many of you in here want to be financially independent? That means that as a black man, as a black male, you don't want to rely on anybody else other than God and yourself in order to be financially secure. Well, we've got a brother that's going to come up here and talk to us about real estate, the power of land ownership, entrepreneurship. He's a young brother who's younger than me, but I look up to him. I watch him grow up in Muhammad's Mosque, number 45. He has become a phenomenal entrepreneur, a father, a husband, and an all around, ser around servant of our community. He is the CEO of Unip. Did y'all hear what I said? He is, this a black CEO. He is the CEO of the self-owned Universal Realty. Give it up for Brother Chad Gordon. Give it up, give it up, give it up. All right, let's give a round of applause to Pastor Jamel Johnson. I don't know why you got me coming up behind him, bro. You brought the fire, man. Let me open up uh, in the name of Allah, the beneficent, the merciful. I bear witness that there is no God but Allah, and I bear witness that Muhammad is his messenger. I greet you all at the Black Male Summit in the greeting words of peace. We say it in Arabic. Assalamu alaikum. That simply means peace be unto you. So thank you, Brother Derek, for extending me the invite. It's an honor. When I look out in the crowd, I know I've seen some of these children when they were born. I know I'm looking at the next generation of leaders, not just for the country, but for the world. So I don't take this for granted. A little about me. I'm Chad Muhammad. I am the CEO of Universal Realty and Management. Uh, I'm also a real estate investor. Anybody know what real estate is? By show of hands, let me ask a young brother in the front, what is it? He shook his head, yeah. Anybody, I wanna hear from the youngsters. I ain't calling on you, my son raising his hand, I ain't calling on you. Khalil. Man, <laughs> Khalil's heard from me before. Okay, land and everything built on top of land. So we talking about 
houses, buildings, vacant land. So I've been doing this for 10 years full time, but I've been in real estate my whole life. Is there anybody in here that was born into real estate? Look at some of y'all looking crazy. Born into real estate. Nobody was born into a hospital. Nobody grew up in a house. Nobody grew up in an apartment. All right. This church that we're in, it's real estate. You can't get away from it. We all are born into it. The question is, do we benefit from it? Unless you plan to take a, a rocket ship up out of here and live on Mars or in space, you're going to deal with real estate every day of your life. All right. So when you get in your car, and even if you're homeless and you live on the street, a street is land that's been paved over with concrete. Y'all know that, right? All right. So when we leave this building, which is real estate, and you get in your car and drive on the road, which is real estate, and then you go get something to eat. And I hope you ain't going to McDonald's, but if it is, that's real estate as well. All right. So you're not going to get away from it. So let me get the next slide. I imagine we pool our resources and start even with a million and acres. start even with a million acres. Now, farming, you're getting into agribusiness. Everybody here eats. But what are you eating? Who's producing your food? That's why you got diabetes. That's why you got cancer. That's why you got AIDS. That's why you got high blood pressure. Because you're eating the wrong foods and you're eating foods that have been denatured. But we always pointing at the white people, but yet we want to spend all of our money on foreigns. We want to spend all our money on luxury as opposed to going and buying some land. America is for sale. And there's a lot of barren land. Disney bought a lot of it in Florida. But the culture has you focused so much on and pulling up in a foreign and rapping about things that could get you locked up and then saying you about prison reform. Mm. Like, it's, bro, we brainwashed out here, bro. Pay attention to everything that Jay Prince was doing because his portfolio is so diversified. Right. As far as just normal real estate investments, stock market. I mean, I'm wearing a hat now, um, Prince Beef, because I have a new burger venture, Trill Burger. So I went out to the ranch yesterday like they had me over to go look at the cows. You know what I'm saying? So for one, from a brand and marketing aspect, Bun B and Jay Prince getting together to, to you know, using Bun B making his burgers from Jay Prince Beef. That sounds good. You know what I'm saying? That's encouraging and inspiring to people. These are two people I look up to. They're working together, breaking bread. That's a, a good thing. But then, like, on the other side, like, going out to a ranch on an estate. Like, Jay Prince got creeks, he got ponds, and he got a lake. Like, I, don't, I ain't never knew nobody had their own lake. <laughs> like, it's real. It's, it's his lake. Like, you could drive for, like, five minutes and still be on Jay Prince's property. You know what I'm saying? And... At first, I looked at it like, yo, this is dope to have this house with all this land. And that's nice from a real estate aspect. But then the fact that he's able to also utilize the land. Like, I remember at one point, Jay Prince was making like over $700,000 a year on hay, right? Which is just a byproduct that you really come up with just from having ranch land and farmland. I'd never forget this. When I went to see the minister, when I saw Minister Farrakhan, he said, Banner, if you really want to be that billionaire you're talking about, grow organic food. He's saying like these white folks are destroying the food and the earth so much. If you create organic food, they will come and bow to you like a king. Y'all didn't catch that. He said just from having land, Jay Prince was able to make $700,000 just off hay. Hay ain't nothing but dried grass that you feed horses and cows. Grass got land on, I mean, land has grass on it anyway, so somebody just cut it, he sold it, and he made almost three quarters of a million dollars. That's powerful. And that's the power of real estate and land ownership. So let's see who's been owning the land so far. We got Queen Elizabeth here, Queen Elizabeth II. She's the Queen of England. She owns roughly 6.6 .6 billion acres worldwide. So much so, her face is on her currency and also the currency of 35 other countries. And to be honest, the royal family, the bulk of their wealth, can anybody guess what it's built off of? What's that? 
slave labor, our ancestors. All right, next slide. Bill Gates, co-founder of Microsoft. This man has invested billions of dollars on the growth and development of genetically modified foods. So when, the minister, when you heard Mr. Farrakhan say, we're eating food that's denatured, that's what he's talking about. These people in laboratories go inside of the seed and change the, 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 the genetic coding of these foods. And the result is development of diseases, uh, which are immune to antibiotics, toxicity, loss of nutrition. So you could be eating an apple. It smells like an apple, tastes like an apple. But when you eat it, it's not giving you any nutrition. In fact, it's having the opposite effect. So this is the power of owning land, owning real estate, and growing what we eat. All right, next slide. These are the results. I won't bother you with the details, but safe to say we are leading in diabetes, hypertension, high blood pressure, heart disease, like Brother Derek Childress. I don't know where he went, but he made that point. Health is wealth. So to the extent that we control and own our real estate, it's to the extent that we have life and life more abundantly. All right, next slide. McDonald's, don't eat it. Next slide. Now I'm joking. <laughs> Keep, go back, go back. Now, I don't want to give away my age, but I remember when a cheeseburger was 39 cents. Anybody remember that? Think of that. A cheeseburger, you get a bun, a piece of meat, you get cheese, pickles, <laughs> ketchup, onions, the paper that they wrap the burger in, and the bag they give it to you in, but 39 cents. That should let you know what you're eating ain't worth nothing. All right? So just think of that. If I, offer, if I served you a burger and you said, thank you, sir, and asked me, okay, how much do I owe you? And I said, you owe me 35 cents. You would think it's a trick. You look like, hey, there's something wrong with it. Hold on, I ain't eating that. And it absolutely is a trick, and we've been dying ever since. All right, next slide. Most wars are fought over land. When countries want to expand their territory, they invade, they take over. When they want to go to a neighboring country's uh, to a neighboring country and take their uh, natural resources, their oil, their gold, their silver, their diamonds, even lithium. Anybody know what lithium is? Lithium is a key component in lithium ion batteries. Lithium ion batteries, uh, they power cell phones, laptops, tablets, everything that these youngsters are on. So even while you on Instagram and TikTok doing y'all little weird dances, that was made possible by land. Keep that in mind. All right. Three necessities of life. This is, I mean, land is everything. We can't get away from it. Food. Y'all know LeBron James and Steph Curry? Well, they can't play basketball if they don't eat. Right? Beyonce, I love her. She's one of the best to ever do it. She got to eat every day in order to do what she does. You know? Clothing. Everybody wear clothes, right? Nobody's naked in here, so it's safe to say y'all wear clothes. That comes from the land. Shelter. We cut down trees. We process it. It makes lumber. We build houses. We build facilities like this beautiful church. Next slide. I'm going to leave y'all with some real tips because not only children, but there's young adults in here that can buy land tomorrow if you wanted to. So I want to leave y'all with some real practical advice. If you're going to buy land, there's three things you got to know. Just You might find somebody who wants to sell it, but when you shoot these things out, they're going to know you know a little something so you won't get swindled. All right. So first things first, get a survey. A survey is a boundary or outline that shows you where your land is located, the dimensions, and if there are any structures that already exist. Because sometimes you can't see the structures if you're looking from a street view because there are trees everywhere. So if I took somebody out to the woods and I said, hey, man, there's your land. You're going to be like, man, it all looked the same. Where is my part? So a survey identifies your part of the land. Get a survey. Number two, get a soil test. A soil test tests the uh, composition of the soil to determine if your soil is weak or strong. So if you want to build a house on land, the soil has to be of a certain strength to be able to hold the house, hold the foundation. Now, if it's weak, you can still build a house, but there's things that you got to do to reinforce the foundation, and it's going to cost you extra money. Number three, make sure you have a source of water. That's vital, because even if you're farming, you got to water those crops. If you got animals on there, they got to have water. And um, more importantly, if you want to live there and build a house, 
you need to make sure there's an active well where you can uh, tap into or they have a public uh, water access that you can tap into. You, if you build a house, you got to flush the toilet, right? Got to take a shower, got to take a bath. All right. Now, I'm talking a lot about like land and farming and growing food, but there's multiple things you can do with it. You can build, of course, you can build a house and you can sell it on the market for a profit. You can flip land. I flip land. I'm a full time real estate professional. I have a brokerage, but I also flip land. Matter of fact, I just bought a piece of land for nine thousand dollars and I sold it for twenty seven thousand dollars. Can anybody give me the profit that I made? We got some mathematicians. I want to hear from y'all. Come on, add it up. What's that? What's that? $18,000 is what he said. I ain't even adding it up. <laughs> yes, sir. Yes, sir. So it's, it's plenty of uh, income potential with just finding pieces of undervalued land. Some people get land for free, inherit it, and they're happy just to make anything. And when you offer to buy it, hey, they want to sell it. You can flip it or you can hold on to it. Or you can farm it. You can grow your food. And that's absolutely vital. All right, next slide. This man is the most honorable Elijah Muhammad. He said, farming is the engine of our national life. So black men and women in America is 40 to 50 million of us. That means we already are a nation. We're divided, but if we come together, we're a nation and God is making a nation out of, out of us as we speak. So if we are to be a, a, a nation that thrives, that survives, we have to go to the land we have to farm. Land ownership is the basis of independence. I know sometimes we talk about independence as a, as a young adult and we say, Oh, I'm out of my mom's house. I'm independent. Oh, I can pay for my own food or my own apartment. That's not real independence. You just got a little money. Truth is, you're still dependent on somebody to feed you. You still got to go to a store to get food to survive. So what if that store closes or they, they decide they don't want to sell to you? What you going to do? You're still dependent on them. So we got to go to the land and become independent. We hear about plug and, you know, in rap music, you hear about the plug. I'm the plug. The plug is the farmer. The plug is the landowner, all right? Even in the drug trade, even in the legal world, the plug is the person who grows the weed, <laughs> who grows the coca leaf. Now, don't grow drugs, y'all. All right, I'll say that again. Do not grow drugs. You'll go to jail. All right, next slide. The Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan said, this activity of land development is going on in Phoenix and in cities around the country, and indeed around the earth. However, to those who spend billions, to, I'm sorry, to those who spend, who, to those who spend those hundreds of millions and billions of dollars building structures, unless we build people, unless the human potential of people is developed, then man in his underdeveloped state will ultimately destroy the cities that he has built because of war, revolution and war. Now, that's a mic drop right there, because I know we're talking about money and land and real estate, but if you ain't right up here, it ain't going to last. You know, some of us, we lie. We, some of us told lies right before we came in here. Some of us stole something right before we got here. And that's okay, but we got to improve. Self-improvement is the basis for community development. And then we go to ownership of land is the basis for uh, independence. So we got to make sure we get the mind right, and then we get our grind right. We go ahead and buy land, and it will not fall, all right? If y'all want any information from me or want to reach out with any questions, I'm sold by Chad on Facebook, Instagram, and TikTok. On TikTok, I'm not doing any dances. I'm strictly giving out information, all right? All right, I hope we all learned something. Anybody learn something today? All praise due to Allah. Thank you. That's my time. Come on, give it up to Brother Chad Muhammad. My apologies, brother. I introduce you as Chad Gordon. It's Brother Chad Muhammad. Young, sharp brother teaching us about land ownership, bro. There are certain communities that teach their children that you cannot even be a man unless you own what? Land. All right. Our next presenter is going to be one that's very special to me. And I'm going to tell you why. Just like this young boy is sitting on the front row. Imagine him someday being a presenter at the Black Male Summit. The next presenter that I'm about to bring up is a young brother who grew up in the Fifth Ward area, a single parent household, faced all of the pressures that other young black men face in the inner city, 
but he's been coming to the Black Male Summit since he was in middle school. He went on to go to Purview A&M University and he got his degree in finance. There are very few black men who get degrees in finance. Not only did he get his de bachelor's degree in fi finance, he is now only a couple of months away from getting his master's degree in finance as well. He once sat on the front row at the Black Male Summit and he now returns as a presenter. Give it up to my youngin, Brandon Barnes. Let's go. How y'all doing? How y'all doing? I need everybody in this room to say get paid. One, two, three. One, two, three. That's a song by one of my favorite rappers, Young Dolph. But one thing about Young Dolph, other than him being a rapper, he did investment stocks, real estate, and things like that. And one thing as black men that we're not taught, you know, coming up in our neighborhood is how can we build financial independence? How can we have financial literacy? So who want to get money? But the next step that's better than getting money is getting money while you sleep. It's not having to do any work and still having that income. So it's a proverb, a Chinese proverb, and the proverb is, when is the best time to plant a tree? Does anybody know? The best time to plant a tree was yesterday. But the second time to plant a tree is today. Next slide. What is investing? The act of investing is committing money or capital to an endeavor with the expectation of attaining an additional income of profit. Does anybody in this room know what a stock is? A share of a company. So we like to buy Jordans, Nike. You know, I have Jordans on right now. But with the same process of these Jordans, I could have had one stock of Nike. So why is this important? The reason of investing and getting stocks, the reason why that is important is because over time, not only does the value of that company increase, but also certain companies issue out dividends. Does anybody in this room know what a dividend is? A dividend is what a comp, oh, I'm sorry. A dividend is something that a company issues out on a monthly or yearly basis that gives their investor who is an owner of that um, et cetera company income of retaining that same share. Next slide. And this is why the main reason of why I wanted to say this presentation, spe specifically today to young men, especially at the ages in elementary and middle school, because the sooner that you start investing, the sums and the compounding interest of your investments will increase over time. So this example, Tanya, age 20, with initial investment of $5,000 and making monthly investments to her portfolio. And when she gets to the age of 65, she would amass of $246,000. But if, but Nikki at the age of 30, if she would make the same initial investments, by the time she is 65, she will only have $141,000. So what I'm saying is the sooner that you invest in, in your portfolio and just in your craft, the more benefits that you will reap. Next slide. And so how does investing work? The main reason how we can increase our total assets is with compounding interest. So compounding interest is just um, putting the same amount of money in each month or each year and watching it grow and just letting it sit. So compounding interest allows you to exponentially increase your investment and income. Next slide. Risk tolerance. And so with different types of investments, there's also, of course, different types of risk. So the same risk that you can do when you're 10, 15, or 20 years old is not the same risk that you can take at ages of 40 or 50 or 60 when you have children or grandchildren. So possibly when the younger that you are, the more risk that you can take no matter what aspect in your life. Next slide. And so these are two um, gentlemen that's in the um, career um, of sports, rap, and things like that. Who knows who anyone in this room know about LeBron James? Greatest basketball player of all time, <laughs> King James. But the one thing that I want you guys to know is LeBron James has made more in his investments with his brands 
enforcements, I mean, I'm sorry, endorsements than he has ever made in his career. Now, instead of taking contracts with Nike just for money, he decided to translate that cash into shocks and um, stocks and shares. So he's becoming a part owner in multiple facets of business, becoming the first active basketball player to become a billionaire. And with Jay-Z, we all know who Jay-Z is, but what makes these players, these artists, billionaires, is not what they're earning, which is earned income with rapping or playing basketball, it's the types of avenues and vehicles that they use their cash flows and to invest in things like businesses, Tidal, which is a music streaming um, service, Rock Nation, and even with LeBron James, with Walmart, Lyft, Nike, and, and et cetera. Next slide. So one thing that I just want to leave here is that by just starting as soon as, as soon as possible with, you know, investing just a little bit at a time, you can really change your life and better and put black people um, as a group taking to the next level. Thank you. And come on, man, y'all can do better than that. Thank you, Brother Brandon. Hey, what did he say? The best time to plant a tree was yesterday. But the next best time is when? Right. Now. All right. Now, on to our next presenter. We're about to land this plane. So don't go to sleep. Don't go anywhere. Don't go home. If you're watching as we're live streaming from the African Diaspora News Channel, do not turn it off. It's about to get good, right? You know, you know how they used to ask the question, when we going to get to the good part? Well, we've gotten to the good part, but the good part is about to get better. Is that right, y'all? All right. Now, Brandon talked about the power of investing. Some of us who grow up in poor zip codes say, I don't have anything to invest. But there's something that every last one of you have that you can use to invest. And I'm saying every last person in this room has it. And that is a voice, a voice. The next brother that I'm about to bring up, he has used his own voice as his primary investment. Many of you have desires to have a YouTube channel and to grow your audience and grow your voice and make that bag off of your YouTube channel. Where well, we're streaming live now from the African Diaspora News Channel, which right now actively has one point three million followers. Let's give the African Diaspora News Channel a round of applause for that. But that 1.3 million followers on YouTube did not come without hard work, dedication, and consistency. So the next brother that we're bringing up is the owner of this channel and those 1.3 to level up his life and his family's life Give it up to my brother, Brother Philip Scott. All right, ladies and gentlemen. Ooh, okay, all right. How y'all doing today? All right, good, good. It's good to see y'all. See, I see some of the moms out here took some of your kids. Appreciate your moms, especially when you got those sons. I know a lot of times you're concerned and you see what's going on. So today I was thinking, you know, when Brother Derek had talked to me yesterday about this, what could I present? And I thought about what I wish somebody would have told me at child age about the world I live in and what I'm about to walk into as a young black man in America and throughout the world. And I wish somebody would have told me in the beginning, because we grow up, we can live in our communities and, and we, we struggle in a lot of times, but what comes outside that community is a war that we're not even prepared to deal with. We're living in the system of racism, white supremacy, that was built off of the backs of our ancestors. 250 years of chattel slavery with a group of people that's the laziest entity on the planet Earth, and still is to this day. This is why they want all this immigration to come into this country from Latin America and other places, because they don't want to work on the farms and do nothing because they're too prissy to get out in the sun. You're living in a system that is built off of anti-black racism, and as a young black man, and you can say black women, but definitely black men, you are the target in this country. You are hated the most. 
This country incentivizes anti-black racism so much so that other groups outside of the white supremacists that come into this, definitely in this country, incentivizes anti-black racism for brownie points to get in good. You were like, why are these group of people targeting me? I ain't doing nothing. What did I do to these groups of people? Why do you hate me? And we just stuck with that. So you got to understand you live in a system of white supremacy that makes you the target. A lot of you are in school. Have you like done things in school and got in trouble? Maybe you, you, you talked out of turn or maybe something happened, right? Now, have any of your white classmates did the same thing like you? Have they? I see some of you shaking their head. Now, if they have, did you notice you got more in trouble than they got in trouble? Have you noticed that in school? It happens because this system has been built even from a childhood to have an immunity of law for them. This is why you have a brother by the name of Jalen Walker that runs from the police and he gets shot 60 times. But you have a white male by the name of Robert Cremo in Highland Park, Illinois, kills seven people from a rooftop, shoot 30. He ran from the police too when, when they were trying to arrest him. And you can see the picture on Google, if you don't believe me, they arrested him, they wasn't afraid of his life, anything. I've been doing this for years, watching black men, black women, just gunned down by what well, we say race soldiers, which police are foot soldiers of white supremacy. That's what they are. You have to understand that you are the enemy, black man, period. Now, once you understand that, that doesn't mean your life is over. That means you just have to understand that. And you have to codify yourself within your community, et cetera. Now, another thing that protects us as black men and the young men, you see this. A lot of you desire to dress good and you want to ride good, et cetera. As a man, you have to provide not only for yourself, but for family that you may have eventually in one day. Y'all young people say get to the bag, et cetera, right? I, some people may talk, but you got to get to your bag. When they tell you go to school, great, go to school, but don't go to college and get a degree where you only go come out making $40,000 a year. That's a waste of money and time. If you're not going to make six figures with that degree, what are you doing? You can go get some skilled trades like electrician, plumber, you know, you can be architect, whatever you want to be and still make the six figures because nobody has sympathy for a man that's struggling and broke. I just passed by right here on the way here. I'm seeing men underneath the bridge. There's help for women. There's help for children. But there is not help for men. Nobody's going to sympathize with you, brother. Okay? And because you're not going to sympathize with you, that's okay. You got to focus on getting to the finance. You got to focus on that. What else I wish somebody would have told me? Not everybody's going to really like me like that. Even within my own community. We have so many differences with each other. We really do. And if you can get past that, not everybody's going to like you. That's okay. Sometimes as a man, you have to stand alone. But that when you're standing alone, that's fine. Friends, that's another thing. Don't hang around people that have nothing to lose. There's been people that went to college, got full scholarships, doing good, come back to their block with their little Pookie and Ray Ray friends, the little thugs, and then they end up getting killed on summer vacation back in the community. You can't hang around people that have nothing to lose. I refuse to. If you have nothing to lose, you can't be around me. You gotta have something that you're working towards, etc. In America also, for you young you know, black men, and, and it's gonna grow up into that, it's a lot of pressure on you. And a lot of us, like I said, we so stressed out. Even as young boys, you could be stressed out. And sometimes you, because you don't realize the system that you're in is a war on your mind constantly. That some people get into alcohol abuse. Some people get into that marijuana use, which is very bad in the black community. And it's the most horrible thing we could use because even Dr. Weston Muhammad talks about the chemicals they put in that mess. That's not even pure what they're doing. Sometimes food addiction is another thing that you get into because of this system. And this is why for me, and I'm a big proponent of this, you must get your passport and travel. Getting out of white supremacy, even for a week or two, would do you so much better. And then when you come back, you can get into the fight. Because it is a fight. Nobody going to come here to save you. 
And yes, you, we can look on God upon high, but then God say, what are you going to do, brother? Are you going to stand? Or are you going to fight? What are you going to do? Don't, and Brother Derek earlier said, wherever he at, about excuses. Just because we deal with these issues and problems, there's no excuse. I come from a poor community, too. I grew up in the area. I seen a crack epidemic. I seen it. I seen the effects on the black community where it tore the black family. I seen it. OK, there's still no excuse why you can't do nothing for yourself. Even though we suffer, we come from the greatest stock on the planet Earth. We survived slavery. We survived the black codes. We survived convict leasing. We survived medical experiments. We survived Jim Crow. We survived in the weaponization of food, the weaponization of medicine. We were surviving the, the, the prison industry. We are surviving everything. So if we can survive all that, do you know the white supremacists hate us because we have survived all that? They hate us for that reason. Like, well, they should be dead by now. Why are they, why are they still around? Because we come from a good stock of people. We are the strongest lineage on the planet Earth. And never forget that. You living below your potential is disrespect to your ancestors. All this mediocrity thinking that we have is disrespect for them. They died so you could thrive. Don't come around here with this poor mouthing and thinking poor mouthing is honorable and mediocrity is honorable. No, it's not. It's dishonorable to the people that had to go through it. As their brothers talked about earlier, entrepreneurship is the way to go. Clock it, punching the clock for a white man is, is a form of slavery still. The white man not going to pay you what you can make on your own. I've made more money on my own than ever punching the clock for a white man. Go and ask the white man, can I take vacation? Can I go here? Can I go to you? A dog, grown dog on man. You know they're not going to treat us right. You have white folks come in the job that's not even qualified. High school diploma. You got three, four degrees. And then they become your boss for six months. Why do we deal with that treatment, black folk? We should, and then black men, we deal with that all the time on the job. All the time. We don't get the promotion. We always on time. Work there 10 years. Nothing happens for us. See, I wish people would have told me that because I would have focused my attention more on entrepreneurship much earlier. Entrepreneurship is freedom for the black man and woman, too, in America and throughout the world. Unification with your people is freedom as well. And I wish more people would have told me that. So definitely, young brothers, y'all yeah, look good out here today. Y'all look very, very good. I appreciate y'all. Just remember that you got to understand that you got to fight every single day. Don't be a coward. Stand up and fight. Get your education. Become entrepreneurs and stay out of trouble because they love to put you in slavery. The 13th Amendment is actually, in one instance, freed us, but in another instance, back door and put us right back in slavery. So definitely keep your record clean. Brother Derek, we thank you for inviting us today. I appreciate it, brother. You know, y'all look good. Thank you. Man, y'all can do better than that for Brother Philip Scott. Brother brought that fire. If you are not already following the African Diaspora News Channel, go to YouTube, go to the African Diaspora News Channel, type it into the search engine, and make sure you hit that follow button. Support that brother. That brother not only is doing very well in his business, but he always gives back. He's always supporting the black community. Anything that we got going on, Brother Phil is a supporter of us. And most importantly, there are certain things, like as followers of the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan, there are certain platforms that won't allow us to come on and speak truth to our people. You got a brother who don't give a damn about what anybody has to say when it comes to speaking truth to black people. Let's give it up again for Brother Phil Scott. All right, now, our final presentation before we have prayer and move out of here is the one that we save the best for last. We call him the best because this brother is what they call an OG. OG in street terms means original gangster. I've been having conversations with my brothers and we basically have been kind of saying, me and Jamel Johnson were talking about this the other day, it's like we lost a whole generation of OGs. You know you, you know you got that OG who sold dope on the corner for five, 10 years. Yeah, he got caught. He went to jail. He did his time. He found God while he was in jail. Now he's back on the street. He got a job. 
He's a deacon at the church, got his family, got his life together. Let's give that brother a round of applause, whoever he is. But if he can get in his Cadillac and on his way to church, look at the same dope corner that he sold dope on, and turn his nose up at the youngsters who he passed the baton to, then he is not doing his duty as an OG. So they say that the OGs are nowhere to be found. And if you out there on the internet are of the belief system, I say, of that belief system, I say tune in. We got one right here. Let's give it up, brothers and sisters, for Reginald OG1 Gordon. He's going to close us out. Let's give him a round of applause. Is the OG ready? All right. Peace, peace, peace. First of all, I want to say this here before I get started. I do no presentations around the country till I give thanks to the person that helped me save my life. That was my mother. And I'm the young people that's here today. At the age of 16, Harris County, the one that's still, you know, Harris County, here we are. Before I get started, that word at the top smart enough. We're going to deal with that word today. Because if we don't, we make up 2%, men and boys, black men and boys make up 2% of Harris County, but we make up 37% of gun violence. I'm going to say that again. We make up only 2% of Harris County, but we make up 37% of gun violence. And I'm going to say this about the brothers here. You know, Les Brown, Les Brown made this statement too. Les Brown, if you know, Les Brown made this statement here. He said, this word negative, negative attention, is 10 times more powerful than this word here, powerful. Positive. And most of the time, I'm looking at the young brothers that even the hottest artist today, NBA young boy, his new song, his new rap song, he's sitting down before he do a video. You seen it? Who seen it? He's doing his video. He's, he's promoting. He's promoting what TDC want us all to be a part of. He's promoting how to get a leg monitor on your ankle. At 16, and I tell young people this here all the time. You know, right now it's 100, it says 100 degrees outside. At 16, I was sitting in a 8 by 10 cell in Texas prison with 200 years. And it was probably 100 outside, and probably in that cell I was in, it was probably 120, 130. And I say that to say this here. Even last night, let me go to, last night a young brother was killed in Houston, Harris County for stealing out of the general dollar. The police killed him last night for stealing out of the general dollar. Houston, Harris County, I do prevention work. I'm a recovery coach. I'm in the Harris County Jail. I'm in the juvenile detention center. I'm a gang intervention officer. So a lot of these areas dealing with this thing called prison, and what we're going to have to smarten up at is because, again, the trap is set, young brothers. The trap is set because a lot of us dealing with the black communities, black boys specifically that I deal with on a daily basis, we're going to deal with them, deal with that population right now because, again, TDC have 80% 80, 80 of TDC is made up of black and brown boys. Let's, let's go to thinking. Let's smarten up. TDC is is eighty percent black and brown boys. Half the black and brown boys that said TDC have what you call a reading deficiency. So that means the public school that we're sending our babies to is not teaching them how to read. They're setting them up. It's called what you see. It's called a trap. 
I'm going back to the negative thing. The building ain't full. You know, we've been talking about young men being killed all over the country. Before I get started any further, can you come up here for a minute, brother? Can you come up here Monday night? You know, I felt the brother's energy because I could feel that he's, he's reaching out for us to not go to sleep on what he's concerned about. Who is this young man, brother? Uh, this is my son, uh, Jalen Randall. He was murdered by HPD April 27th, uh, unarmed black man. And uh, he jumped out the car within three seconds. He was shot before the officer could even issue out a command by saying, put your hands up. It was put yo. And by that time, he was already shot and dead. They hogtied him, drug him across the street. But let me tell you, it's a martial law being imposed upon all black people within this community, within this country, where you can't wear what you want to wear, where you can't do what you want to do, where you can't be outside where you want to be. They're planning and, and planting moles and racist police within our systems. We need to be aware of that. We need to be conscious of that. We need to tell our kids, educate them about that. That's what's going on in America right now, a hidden war amongst black people, on black people. Thank you, brother. Thank you, brother. This is a, this is a concerned father. That a lot of times, most of us don't think it's going to hit our household. But I'm going to tell you what the brother did say. Harris County tried to cover it up when they knew they shot him behind the back of the head. Harris County, Harris County said, no, he didn't get shot behind the back of the head. They went against their own families when they had the autopsy done. The family did it their personal self. But Harris County still tried to cover it up. What I'm telling you, black boys, what I'm telling you right now, we are at war. And just like he said, we're dealing with a police department that have been infiltrated, but have been infiltrated by people that don't give a damn about you and me. So that's why it's good today to say, you come to a summit to smarten up. Why do we need to smarten up? Because again, how did I get out of prison after being given 200 years in prison? Don't you want to ask, don't you want to know the answer to that question? How did I get out of prison? When at one time in prison, I had to walk around with this kind of stuff stuck up my behind so I could survive. We talking about survival. You practice it? Who practice? What are gangsters at in the room? Let's keep it real. What are gangsters at in the room? How many of y'all get used every day in prison, everywhere I went in prison for 20 years due to me being by, everywhere I went, they handcuffed me with these things around my waist, around my ankles, and I was escorted everywhere I went. Are you getting ready? Because again, the trap is set because you know what? A lot of young brothers like negative behavior. I'm hard, dog. I'm, you know why? Because again, the last three months, I've been dealing with what you call the mass black men not knowing how to identify with their feelings, we live behind a mask. We wake up, we put that mask on because again, we can't be our own individual selves out here in this world. So we pretend to be something else. I'm hard, dog. I'm, I'm, you know, we, what's up, fool? I'm, I'm, I'm savage, I'm savage, man. We always got to pretend to fit in when we know that's a trap. The study has been said earlier, one out of every three of us gonna be have a contact with this prison industrial compound. Are you ready? 70% of our households are being raised by our mothers. I set this kind of stuff up everywhere I go. And as I set this stuff up, I let, let young people know that this is, the, this is the plan. Life without parole. Even though my father wasn't in my life, my mother did everything in her power. Y'all know what I'm talking about. 
Don't hang with that boy. That boy gonna get you in trouble. That boy ain't no good for you. You know what you need to do. Your mama always hollering, trying to pull for you. And but what we do, because again, because again, we think we know better than our mothers and the people that's around us that's giving us great advice. But in Texas, they got something called the Texas Laws of Party. Who know what the Texas Laws of Party is? Come on, gangsters. Come on, gangsters. What's the Texas Laws of Party? I'm going to tell you what these people got set up for you. You know what the Texas Laws of Party is, Blair? You don't know what the Texas Laws of Party is? Who? Come on, brother. Y'all don't know what the Texas Laws of Party is? That means if you go with me like my homeboy, where he at? He is. He is. One of my students, one of my students at home on probation. And his homeboy drove up there to pick him up. He got that leg monitor at home. Homeboy come to pick him up. He know he ain't supposed to go out there. You ever rebel? You ever did something you weren't supposed to do? His homeboy. You know, we, our homeboy got more power than us. He jumped in the car with his homeboy. They went down to the store. At the store, he stayed in the car. He thought he wasn't doing nothing wrong. His homeboy went in the store. His homeboy went in the store. And before you know it, he see his home. He's sitting in the car. He see his homeboy robbing the man at the store. He sitting, see him robbing the man at the store. By us have that that no snitch behavior. You know that, that, that you know, by us, but I'm not, like I ain't snitching, dog. You know what I'm saying? That ain't on me. I ain't doing it. That don't be on you, dog. You're gonna be the one getting trouble, dog. And we run around here with that no snitch. Soon as he ran, he shot the man and killed the man in the store. You know, the, and, the, and the kid come from a good family, he gang related. Mama did everything in her power to get him out the gang. But he had to, the people that he was surrounded by had more influence than the mama. He hanging in, he hanging in the car with his homeboy. He, 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 what would you have did, bro? If you see your homeboy robbing in the stove and you sitting in the car just kicking it, what would you do? You'd have drove me over, huh? Okay. What you done did, player? What you done did? You, you sitting in the car with me and you see me rob somebody in the stove. What would you do? You gonna snitch on me? You snitching, dog? Yeah, come on, dog. I thought me and you was homeboy. You snitching, dog? See, that's the game they play on us. And we don't have enough courage and confidence in ourselves. We fall in line. And you know what happened? He went downtown. And they gave him some coffee and a donut and let him smoke a cigarette. And the, and the next thing you know where he was at? Snitching on you. He was snitching. He goes, see, see, I, ain't, I'm, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't do a day for you, brother. Ain't no ain't no such. You, you think you got them homeboys talking about, hey, you, I got your back. Ain't no such thing. When you in that, when you in the police department and sitting in that room, he finna save himself. You keep thinking my homeboy. Yeah, he's your homeboy. What he tell him? You, your mama, your daddy, and somebody else in your family. Here I am sitting in there at 16 years old, hanging out with hanging out with the big homies. And the big homies were snitching. Oh, you young. They're they gonna give you probation. You ain't 16 years old. And I'm I'm sitting there, I'm sitting there with that www.dumbass.com right across my head. I'm, oh, yeah, my homeboys got my back. Yeah, they had my back all right. They told on me, my granddaddy, my uncle, my auntie, and everybody else when I come out the office. And here I am. You have to always fall back on that person that said, I told you not to hang with the boy. You're always hard when you got to go back. Mama say, I told your ass. You ever had that, brother? You, 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 you done, done something, then you, you had to come back and say, uh, uh, uh. Uh, you you got me. There you go. Let's keep it real. It's sad. I got, I got to keep it real everywhere we go because too many of us losing our lives. And young people, young people know when you're lying to them because as soon as they see you, they don't feel your energy. They're going to Google whatever come out your mouth. Oh, he ain't, he, ain't, he ain't real. He come told me somebody else's story. That ain't real. It took me 20 years I stayed in prison. Like I said, my first four years because again, when I was out here on the streets and I rebelled, my mother did everything in her power to try to save me. She put the house up, 
and put it in the hands of one of the most things called a lawyer. He told my mama, oh, he's 16, he good probation. They, won't, they ain't going to give him no whole lot of time. When they went to give me 50 years count one, 50 years count two, 50 years count three, 50 years count four, I couldn't hardly breathe when I got through out that courtroom. And they handcuffed me and they escorted me out that courtroom like that there. And the next thing you know, they had me on Ferguson unit. You ever picked in the cotton player? Huh? You ain't picked no cotton? Let's stay on Ferguson unit. How many y'all going, going to pitch that? Like we got to ask that question now. Because there's too many brothers seem like they just don't care no more. I got 886 brothers I deal with from the age of 17 to 21 in the Harris County Jail right now. Did you hear what I say? 17 to 21, yo. I have 800 of them in the Harris County Jail I go deal with. Half of them got murder cases, assault cases. And when you sit down and talk to them, a lot of the young brothers that come out of the CPS that, that have been abandoned from the street, a lot of our young brothers have become from very domestic households. Do y'all know what I mean? They come from families where fathers rejected them and the mothers was tired of putting up with them. You look like your daddy. Get away from me. I'm tired of you. Black people, suicide have become the number one killer. Suicide amongst our young people due to depression amongst our young people have hit a high rise. There's a new drug coming in our community at the end of the month. You better keep your eyes open. You think crack cocaine destroyed our community? Wait till it's fitting on in our community. They got a new drug finna hit the black community. It's called an elephant tranquilizer. They always coming up with plans because you don't have one. And when somebody try to give you some good information, pardon your ass up. You try to reject somebody. I'm telling you, they would tear down your school before they tear down Harris County Jail. And, li and, listen, at and listen at this here, mothers. Your teenagers are worth $400 a day every day they keep him locked up. So if you can do the math, $400 a day, Times a month, times a year. Ooh, they making plenty of money on Ray Ray and Pookie. Ain't they? But that's silent because right now we ain't worried. They got us so stressed out. Worry about COVID. They got us so stressed out. Worry about don't look at the car next to you. They got us so stressed out. You can't even let your kids go out to play no more because you don't know who he gonna run into. Then we got the great governor. We got our great governor. I think my brother Swart in here. He wrote this. Didn't he? No, you write this. We got our great governor say, "Well, it ain't enough killing. Let's just make that gun law where everybody can have a damn pistol. Let's just set them all up. Young people, parents, I'm gonna tell y'all this here." I do this kind of work daily. I'm on the streets daily. I'm getting phone calls from mothers daily trying to dump their children off at my facility. We're in a serious time called what we want to call a state of emergency. So when we're in a state of emergency, what is your plan? What I mean, what we got to we got to make a plan. If we don't have to, we got to go back to figuring out how do we stop the killing in our community and make it safer. For once, we got to do what I've been talking about. We got to build a strong arm in our community. The men going to have to come from behind the doors, quit being scared, and we got to gather up and come together and learn how to put, again, again, in the gang, listen, listen, in the gang lifestyle, in the gang lifestyle, the Crips and the Bloods, they had rules and regulations. If you break one rule and regulation, they will whoop you. We got to get back some rules and regulations amongst our young people. They don't love me because I got a bunch of money. They love me because they know I love them and I can respect them. How do we get started? We get started by everybody in this room. Because just like that brother come up here, he didn't come up here because he thought he was next.
Did you hear what I said? But it's going to be a next. We on a, we on a roll right now this year alone. Me and the minister last year, we tried to put a halt. We tried to put a halt. We knock on doors. We walk in the street. We tried to put a halt on the 500 murders that was going to happen in this city. Because if, if, if it's counting, that means somebody in this room going to get next. Young people, mothers, before I leave, the minister said it clear years ago, justifiable homicide. We get, they're killing us. They are killing us. And these people are making the money. Did y'all hear about that woman selling body parts? Y'all want to see an article they've been selling our body parts? I didn't wear this orange shirt today. This, this, this orange shirt I got on called, it's for gun violence. It ain't this orange no more. Before I get off the stage, young brothers, I was hardwired. I was hardwired to negative behavior because if I didn't love myself, I had to find something to fit into. I come from that population of young brothers that had a reading disorder. So I, I, I faked it to make it. Through all through middle school, I faked it to make it. Didn't nobody really was concerned because I was a good student. I showed up every day. But by the time I got into sixth and seventh grade, when the teacher put me in front of the classroom to, when the teacher put me in front of the classroom to say, Mr. Gordon, Mr. Gordon, I need you to read chapter such and such. And I went to looking, I went to fumbling, I went to fumbling, got nervous, got fumbling, because I ain't never been pulled in the front. Then I got to looking at them things. You know how we do it? Come on, y'all. Let's you know, you know how we do it. We have, we have to pretend to do something. Oh, I, I, I left my glasses at home. I can't, I can't see these words. I don't, I, don't know, I don't know what's going on. Because of the shame, embarrassment that set in on me, feel like Brother Derek say, if there's in the village, an African proverb says it like this here. A, a child will burn down the village for the warmth, for the warmth of the family. So I would, a child would do what he got to do to get your attention. If we don't figure out in this day and time, how do we reconstruct the mind. We got to deal with the mind. We got to get that Negro behavior out of there. That slave mentality. We got to take over our schools. We got to take over these jails. And we got to get in the mood of learning how to, to protect our women, our elders, and our children. And if the OGs that's on the street scared to do it, get back. Just give us some finances to go to. We, if you're scared, if you're scared, get out the way. We're not asking everybody to get out there with us to do the work on the street. We know everybody's not capable of getting out there and doing the work. But you can do something. You can put pressure on the city down there. That's giving away money that, to people that's not doing the work. People, young people. Young people. TDC. HPD. Harris County Department. They have, pers they have purposely put these things together. They don't even put them on us no more. They're killing us so fast. And then when they're killing us, they're still wrapping us with these chain. My message to you before I get off the floor. I know Brother Dave Lee. I'm going to show you something. Y'all know I started the program straight from Solomon. Y'all know I started that program that scared straight this all over the world. When I was see, so I would say, so so I figured out a way to get that negative behavior and turn it into some positive behavior. So I did what I had to do. I had to go to work against the people, just like I got in there. I had to figure out how to get the hell up out of there. So I had to put myself. I put together that program called Scared Straight. It went all over the world. They went to loving me to death. Oh, he's very brilliant. But I didn't stop there. I got out of the prison and I put the program together it's called Operation Outreach OG One. And in OG One, what I did, I kept moving forward. What I did, I became what you call a car salesman. 
I was selling cars that went to put me in the newspaper in Tilburg, Texas on Fort Hood. You know what I'm saying? I was selling so many cars, I became salesperson of the year when I got out. You know what I'm saying? That didn't stop me there because even when I even when I was in prison, I had to work on my body. In my body, in my mind, I was working on it. So I became what you call a power lift in prison. I became the number one power lift in 165 class, picked up 705 pounds. I knew a person that weighed 165. See, I'm gonna show you the pictures. Then I then that, that didn't stop me there. I became what you call an OG1 model. Whole Foods put me on the stage and put me on big billboards and made me an OG1 model. And even today, young people, I'm state certified. As a recovery peer pressure specialist, I'm a mental health peer pressure specialist. I'm an anger management counselor. You know what I'm saying? I'm a gang intervention specialist. I'm very skillful in there, but you know what? Somehow they scared, somehow they scared to let me loose with them brothers in that jail and on the street. I want to work. Look here, I need to be out there with the community support so I can do my thing and speak. Because one thing I learned about young people. They don't give a damn how much you know till they know how much you care. Thank y'all. I appreciate it. Have a great day. Yeah, give it up for OG1. Give it up for OG1. Come on, y'all can do better than that. All right. Was that not a powerful way to wrap up the Black Male Summit? Let me first say thank you all so much for coming and spending your precious time with us. It was time well spent. I don't know about you, but I'm leaving out of this building better than when I came in the building. I'm leaving out encouraged. I'm leaving out educated. I'm leaving out inspired. I'm leaving out empowered. Thanks to brothers like OG1 and the other presenters who donated their time today. Give it up for the presenters. Give it up for brother Chad Gordon. Excuse me, brother Chad Muhammad, who taught us about land ownership. Give it up for brother Brandon Barnes, who taught us the importance of investing your money and not blowing your money. Give it up for Brother Derek Childress Jr. who taught us to never forget where you came from and to fight for your people no matter what. Give it up for Pastor Jamel Johnson who taught us to be self-inspired, self-motivated, self-aware. Give it up for my brother, who am I missing? And give it up to Brother Philip Scott who taught us the reality of what it is to be a black man in America and what it is that we have to do in order to survive and thrive in this country. If we could, as we close out, could we get all of the youngsters to stand up and come down toward the front? We want to end in prayer, but we want to end in a prayer where we pray over our young boys. If we could, Brother Abdul Halim Muhammad, if you will, come and close us out with a word of prayer. Brother Warren Randall, could you please come here? We're making good time. We're making good time. Hold up the picture of your son. Right now, there are protests going on in Akron, Ohio. A young brother by the name of Jalen Walker was shot 60 times by the police in Akron, Ohio. But right here in the city of Houston, in Pleasantville, Texas, his son, Jalen Randall, was shot many times, three seconds after he got out of the vehicle, shot down. He's fighting for justice for his son right now. And he told you, he said he had no idea that he would be in this position someday. My word to all of the young brothers who were standing in front of me. Don't die on me. Don't die on me. There are some out here who want attention so bad that they would rather be somebody 
on the front of an R.I.P. T-shirt than to be nobody in real life. We got to let them know that you are not a nobody. And the best place to do that is in our own homes, in our own communities. Every last one of you is a celebrity among your own people. And we're going to do our best to make you feel like that as much as possible. So as we pray over our young men and our young boys, we also want to pray for Brother Warren Randall and pray for his family as they continue to fight for justice. If you want to get a brother a hug on your way out, trust me, I believe that he can use it. I love y'all. Brother Abdul Halim Muhammad, could you please close us out, sir? Y'all give Brother Derek and all of the presenters a round of applause. Come on, come on, come on, come on. Now, he know, I sit here through everybody's presentation because I always learn something from somebody. Every one of these persons here and every one of you is an individual miracle created by God. There's nobody like you. There never was. And there never will be. So live your life. The last thing I will say before I pray is you are what is called the Joshua generation. Who are you? Who are you? Joshua generation means that you were born to lead us to the promised land. You are the strongest, the most powerful, the most fearless generation we've ever produced. But don't let the enemy use you to kill yourself or kill others. Smarten up. Smarten up. Smarten up. And live your life to the fullest. Everybody get a little closer. Y'all got masks on. Take your hands out your pocket. Touch somebody. Come on up here, y'all. Touch me. Come on, come on. Where you at, Pastor Jamel? I need you. The wind beneath my wings. There you go. Everybody touch somebody. You're all solitary. In the name of Allah, the beneficent, the merciful. Oh, Allah, we beseech our help. We ask thy mercy. For we believe in you and we trust in you for all that we need. We help us in your cause with your apostle. Please grant to us success. We seek refuge from anxiety and grief. We seek refuge from lack of strength and laziness. We seek refuge from cowardice and niggardliness, and we seek refuge from being overpowered by debt and the oppression of men. O oh Allah, suffice thou us with what is lawful. Keep us away from what is prohibited, and with your grace make us free of one of all that is besides thee. We ask thee, O oh Allah, in the name of all of your servants, to bless this generation, to make not our lives that we have given and the hours we have spent be in vain. O oh Allah, we are candles that are giving off light. And every candle that gives off light is being consumed. But we pray, God, that the light that we gave off today will light the wicks of our young people so that that light will not die with us when we go to the grave, but will continue on and lead and brighten the world. O oh Allah, let these young people know that they, there is no light at the end of the tunnel, that they are the light in the tunnel. Oh Allah, let these young people know that they are those who our ancestors prayed for when they were on those slave ships, that they were the ones that they sung about, they knew were going to come when they were on the plantation picking that cotton. Oh Allah, let them know that they're the ones that they prayed for, that they sung about when they said, we shall overcome. They know it was you and it was Dr. King who said, I may not get there with you but he know that we as the people will get to the promised land. This is the Joshua generation, oh Allah. Let them know and have the knowledge of self. Let them know you. Let them know what they were born for. Protect them and watch over them and give their mother the love that they deserve to not be burying their children, but as it should be, that our children bury our elders. We ask, almighty God, that you would bless us in the name of all of your servants, Moses, Jesus, Muhammad, and all of those names that we don't know, 
we ask that you would bless us in the name of our ancestors and that they are the answer to our prayers. Protect them and watch over them, O oh Allah. We ask you in your holy and righteous name. Amen. All right, all right, all right. One second, family. One second, family. Did my assistant has a presentation that she wants to make? What? What? So on our way here, we was thinking about what we could contribute. Oh. We were thinking about what we could give Brother Derek for all he does for everybody else. I'm going to read it to you. What's from my sons? It says, from the young black warriors worldwide, my prayer to the ancestors. I wanted to stay out of trouble and not end up like the men in my family. So I asked the ancestors for wisdom and they blessed me with you. Thank you for showing me how to lead my family, look after my people, and be an unapologetic black man. I pray that I am blessed enough to continue learning from you and someday continue your legacy. Your nephew, Muhammad. This is beautiful. Thank you so much. They drove all the way here from Akron, Ohio to be here at the Black Male Summit and to present. Thank you so much, Sister Kamisha. And thank you to my nephews. Okay, family, please get home safely. Um, as you got here safely, there are some box lunches, I think, downstairs. There, there are a limited supply of them, so please allow the children to eat before the adults eat. Also, where's my final call newspaper? Where's my, is back, can, can you grab it for me? Thank you. It can, hold it up for me. Yes, sir. Yeah, the, there are final call newspapers available at the back of the, uh, the, the, the room. So as you go out, please take one, read it from cover to cover, sharpen your mind, sharpen your insight on what's going on with black people. And you know, on that note, when I say, on, on the count of three, I want you to say smarten up, all right? Smarten up on three. What are we gonna say on three? I cannot hear you. What are we gonna say on three? I cannot hear you. What are we gonna say on three? One, two, three. One, two, three. One, two, three. All right, smarten up. Love y'all. Peace. <laughs>